Today we are continuing our series called Who Am I? with an episode that I'm titling You Are Forgiven. Now, you might think this is a pretty basic truth of the Christian faith, Amber. There's really no reason to talk about that. And to that, I'd say I disagree. I think a lot of people are sitting in our pews, sitting in our midst, uh, feeling shame over something that they've done in their past, and they don't quite know how to get past it. And that's what today's episode is about. Hey, it's Amber, wife, mother, type A child of God. Here are little things we look at everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for listening. So first of all, I want to explain the difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is what we feel when we've committed an offense, when we've done something wrong. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. That's your conscience at work. One of the prayers that I pray for my children, for myself and for my husband, is that our conscience would stay stay strong, that we would feel the guilt. We can very much dull our conscience by continuing to commit a sin and no longer feel any guilt for doing it. So for instance, I'm going to use something that's pretty common. If you are used to speeding, so going over the speed limit, the speed limit 60 miles an hour, and you in your mind think, well, I mean, I can probably go 65, even 67 before the police will give me a ticket. So if you're used to that, you don't even feel guilt anymore when you speed. Whereas if you make a point of only going the speed limit, then even if you go to pass somebody that's going 52 miles an hour and you end up going 63 or whatever, you notice it because you haven't dulled your conscience to that sin. So guilt is not a bad thing. It just means that our conscience is working. We're feeling sorry when we do something wrong, or at least we know, we notice when we do something wrong. Shame, on the other hand, that is not such a great thing because that is a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by a foolish behavior. So again, it's okay to feel shame when you do something really stupid. I think that's what the apostle Peter was feeling when he denied knowing Jesus, and he wept bitterly. He went out of the courtyard and he wept bitterly. He was feeling intense shame. He was feeling this deep distress and humiliation that he had denied his Lord and Savior, who he loved very much. So it's not entirely a terrible thing to feel shame if it causes us to turn to God for forgiveness. So when we feel that shame, when we say, you know what, I did something stupid, that was wrong, I'm sorry I did it, it won't happen again, you go to God and you say, God, please forgive me, I do know that it's wrong, and I'm sorry I allowed myself to go there. Um, That's a good thing. Shame has done what it was meant to do, guilt has done what it was meant to do, and that is to push you into the arms of your loving Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You go to him, you know you are forgiven, and it is gone. It is as far as the east is from the west. That's how far God says that he has removed our sins. So that's what shame and guilt are supposed to do. What shame is not supposed to do is live in our heart and live in our mind and keep rearing its ugly head over and over and over and paralyze us or keep us from doing the important work that God would have us do. That happens when we think things like, well, God could never use me because I did that. Or when you think, well, there's no way I could tell somebody not to sin in this way because I sinned in that way. So how could I stand up and say to them, you know, you probably shouldn't do that when I did it. That's not the purpose of shame. That's Satan using shame to his advantage because what Satan and his evil army want to do more than anything is shut us up and keep us from doing the important work that God has for us to do on earth. 
If you um, know anything about Alcoholics Anonymous or the alcohol treatment programs, a lot of the counselors that they use are former users. And there's a reason for that. Their shame didn't keep them down. Once they learned and knew a different, better way, they want to teach other people how to get out of what they were in so that they too can have this life of freedom apart from alcohol. So our shame isn't supposed to keep us down. Now, I experienced this myself uh, one day a long time ago, years ago. I had this certain sin that I just kept um, feeling the shame about. And I, I would push it down for a certain amount of time, and then it would come back up. It would rear its ugly head, and I would be all bummed out, and I, I just wallowed in that guilt. And I was on the treadmill one day working out, and I just couldn't get over this feeling of just shame. It was just so heavy on me. And it just occurred to me in that moment that when I allowed the shame to win, I was really saying to Jesus, your sacrifice isn't enough. You might have died for everybody else, but there's no way you died for me. And you, there's no way you died for that sin. You can, you can forgive other people, but probably not me. And as soon as I realized it for what it was, which is just a trap of Satan to keep me stuck, it was gone. That was the last time. If it ever reared its ugly head again, the thought of that sin, I just said, yep, I did. I did do that. And I am sorry. And the blood of Jesus covers it. And it was done. It was over. Hands down. So how do I know beyond a shadow of doubt that God does not want you to live in your shame? Well, I'm going to give you some examples and I'm going to give you some Bible passages. So first of all, examples from the Bible. I've already told you about Peter, the Apostle Peter. When he denied Jesus, Jesus didn't come back upon his resurrection and say, you know, Peter, I had high hopes for you. And I'm I'm sorry. You know, I can maybe see if I can find some place for you in the back room that you can do something now and then. But really, what you did is just going to pretty much eliminate you from service in my kingdom. Jesus reinstated Peter. Three times. Do you love me? Yep. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. I have work for you to do, Peter. You're still an apostle. Yep, you made a mistake. But I can still use you. The woman at the well. She'd been married five times, was living with someone who was not her husband. Jesus didn't come to her. He did use the law. Go and get your husband. I don't have a husband. Nope, you've had five, and the man you're living with is not your husband. He did use the law, but he didn't use it to hammer her down. Like, how dare you think you are worth saving? He used the law so that she would know she needed him. And then he revealed himself to her so that she could be in his kingdom forever. So he didn't want her stuck in the shame of this is who you were. He used her. She brought an entire town to know Jesus. So there are so many examples. I mean, Moses killed a man and God used him in great ways for service. But what I, I really love and I want to use today is the example of the Apostle Paul. So the Apostle Paul you know, we know he was a Pharisee and he was a very righteous man. He was just unbelievably amazing um, as far as a Pharisee. He could keep the law. He loved to keep the law. He loved what he was doing. And then this whole Jesus thing came about and people started believing in Jesus and they began this Christian sect of a new belief. And he took it upon himself to squash that. He wanted nothing more than to rid the earth of these new Christians. And he did that by watching over as Stephen was killed. He was on his way to Damascus to put some in prison. 
Um, he, he was a murderer and a torturer and he was unfair. He was a persecutor. And yet God took him, changed his thinking. He revealed himself to the apostle Paul. And when the apostle Paul became a Christian, when he realized who Jesus was, what Jesus had done, it changed everything for him. And he didn't wallow in his shame. He didn't say, oh man, because I was this, I really probably should just stay on the sidelines and not do much with the rest of my life. Nope. The Apostle Paul took this newfound knowledge and used it as a motivator to get him in front of as many people as he could possibly get in front of. Because he wanted them to know Christ as the means of salvation too. So that's how we use our sin to our advantage. Instead of wallowing in it, yep, that's what I did. I don't think I'm worthwhile for much of anything anymore. Nope. Use it as a motivator. I was this. I'm not this. I know the freedom that I have in Christ now. And because of that, I want you to know it. That's what our sin, that's what our guilt, that's what our shame is supposed to do in our lives. Now, I want to read to you from 1 Corinthians, which was written by the Apostle Paul, uh, chapter 1, starting at verse 26. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. So now we use our shame, which has motivated us to be very vocal about the freedom that we have in Christ, to shame those people who are super good in their own self And thinking, I'm good enough. I'm of noble birth. I'm influential. I'm rich. I'm powerful. I've got it all. And we say, no, 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 no. I had the futility of that thinking before. But now, did you catch those last three words in this reading? Now, Um, the wisdom that is from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. What we get in Christ Jesus is righteousness, right standing with God. So you don't have to wallow in your shame because in God's eyes, when you go to him, believing in the blood of his son, that excruciating death that Jesus had on the cross, the, the life of suffering that Jesus had, when he lived perfectly in a sinful world, that all paid for our sin. And so we have right standing. We have, we're have we righteous before God. We have right standing before God. Holiness is set apart. I always think when I think of the word holiness, I think of all the tools and the instruments in the temple that were holy, all the little things that were set apart to be used in God's service. That's what we are. We are holy. We're set apart for use in God's kingdom. And then redemption. Redemption is being bought back. We we were. We were stuck in our sin. We were that. We no longer are because we have been redeemed. We have been bought back. We've been purchased by that blood, the precious blood of Christ. So we no longer have to stay in that shame because we are redeemed. We are righteous. We are holy. So now that you are motivated, now that you know that that sin is covered, completely, totally covered, no longer a point. Don't bring it up. Wash clean. 
you're clean. What do you do with it? In the book of Jude, verses 20 to 23, we read this. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. So I want you to notice, (laughs) you are dear friends of God. You cannot help but read the Bible and realize how much God loves you. All the all the characteristics, all the things he calls you, dearly beloved, holy, merciful, chosen, set apart, all these things. First of all, you are dear friends of God's. Build yourself up in your faith. Pray in the spirit as you keep yourself in God's love. You're not in detention. You're in God's love. So Just because of that sin that you committed whenever you committed it, I don't care if it was yesterday or two weeks ago or two decades ago or whatever, you are in God's love. That's where you are. It's paid in full. It's forgiven. You're in God's love. And then be merciful. Show mercy to those who are still doubting. I don't know, man. I don't know if God could forgive me. I've done some pretty horrible things. Let me tell you, I can tell you with all certainty that the blood of Jesus paid for all of it. So yep, paid in full, redeemed, holy, set apart, righteous, with right standing before God. Not because of what you've done, but because of Jesus' blood. And then snatch others from the fire. Look, when you see those people who are still in their sin, who are still, I hear it all the time. You hear it all the time. The people who are like, I'm going to hell, so I might as well live it up while I'm here. Why would you want to go to hell? Why do you think you're going to hell? Why don't you think you can get into heaven? Start asking questions. Snatch them from the fire. Do you know what hell is? Do you know what it's like to be apart from God for the rest of your eternity? Do you, do you have any idea what that is? Snatch them from the fire. And then to others who are absolutely dead set on sinning and they don't want to hear it. Well, those people you can keep at a distance and pray for them. Pray for them to come to know the truth about Jesus Christ, their Savior. But in the meantime, those people you might might need to keep at arm's length. But that's okay. Because the main thing is, you've got work to do. We can't have you sitting in your shame. We can't have you wallowing in bed thinking you're unusable because we need all hands on deck. Our time is short. One day... All of us will be with Jesus in heaven. But as long as we're here, we all have people in our sphere of influence. We all have friends. We have neighbors. We have coworkers who do not yet know the Lord. So use your newfound freedom of forgiveness to motivate you to have a conversation, to tell people, oh, yeah, I've sinned too. I know what it feels like to feel hopeless and to feel like I have done what's unforgivable. But let me tell you about my Jesus. He left heaven where everything was perfect, where he was adored by angels to come to this very imperfect world, to experience and feel all that this sinful nature, all that this sinful world threw at him. He felt hunger, fear, rejection, but he lived a perfect life. And then because he was the only one, 
who could be the sacrifice to pay for everybody else's sin because he had never sinned. He offered his life for me and for you. And because of that, the blood of Jesus pays our way to heaven. And that's where I would like you to be with me forever in heaven. And we can talk about how good God was to save us and how good God is that we get to live here instead of where we belong. That's the only thing that shame is good for. So if you identify as anything, identify as a forgiven child of God, because that is what you are. This has been Little Things, because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things.